All right, so we're talking about cladistics and um, the difference between cladistics and what exactly it is compared to what they used to call old school taxonomy, which was mainly looking at the way that uh, organisms were built. So if you looked at old school taxonomy and uh, you saw like lizards and crocodiles and dinosaurs, you'd say that they looked very similar to each other. However, what they do now know is after we've gone over the evidence of natural selection worksheet where you have fossils, biochemical evidence, and then uh, comparative anatomy, that they actually the birds have more in common with dinosaurs than we ever thought before. Especially the last 30, 40 years where they've come up with lots of DNA evidence and they've come up with uh, lots of fossils and comparative anatomy where you can look at different things to see how they compare. They now know that it isn't really about looks. And when you look at things, you, there's a lot of subjective nature to that as well. So it's hard to group organisms or determine their evolutionary history just based on the, the way they look. Uh, Data-driven stuff's better, especially with DNA. With DNA, when you have where you can count base pairs and see how many actual base pairs that they have in common, uh, and you can compare those to each other. So DNA is a very powerful tool in that sense. So uh, probably about 20 years ago, they came up with this thing called cladistics. So I'm going to go through the notes on here with this little note packet. Um, this is what I did in class, and it seems to work pretty well. I'm going to put this on Edmodo so you can take a look at it. But cladistics is what we're looking at. Um, cladistics, uh, don't actually know where the name comes from, but cladistics is a way of come establishing evolutionary relatedness, and you're going to do it through these things called cladograms, which are basically like family trees. And Kyle's with me right now, too, so if you have a question, Kyle, you're more than welcome to All right, ask yeah. it. All right. So we have these family trees. It looks a little bit different than a normal family tree. Um, I don't know why they're set up like this, but they always go at this angle. You won't always have this dark line, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. All right, so uh, cladistics. Through cladistics, what are trying, scientists trying to do? They're trying to establish evolutionary relatedness And the way that they do that is with a cladogram, just like we talked about before, and counting shared derived characteristics. We'll also put that down in parentheses, traits, because you can refer to them either way. So shared meaning we both have it, derived meaning it came from the same place, and characteristic or trait is just some sort of common feature that we have. So that was a thing that I had a lot of trouble with in college is understanding that phrase. But now that I know that it's shared, we have it, it came from the same place, derived, came from that same common ancestry. So we're really talking about homologous features, things that are, have a common ancestry. So with cladistics, the greater the number of these shared, derived, uh, traits, the closer the uh, relationship between organisms or phylogenies. Now one of the things I forgot to tell you is this word phylogeny at the beginning. Phylo kind of means family, geny kind of refers to genetics. That really the easiest way to remember that is it's kind of like it's a family. Phylogeny is a family. So through cladistics we're trying to establish these phylogenies and also figure it out who's in what phylogeny. So I have this little thing here, this data table that kind of shows how scientists break up or organize these organisms. It's a super simple way of looking at it. We're going to look at pretty much some basic characteristics, but scientists will look at this with just a, gin a ginormous amount of data. And I had a professor in college that had, uh, it's probably about 30 feet long, six feet tall, and it was a giant cladogram of 27 species of toads and all kinds of data that went with it. The beauty with a cladogram though is it's data driven so either it has it or it doesn't have it. And once you get it set up you really don't need to change anything as opposed to if you looked at somebody and somebody said well this looks this way and this looks this way. Alright so we got uh, five different animals that we're going to look at. We're going to look at a freshwater eel, freshwater eel, and these are some animals we just came up with and they, they work pretty well for this explanation just so you can get it. Uh, an iguana, a deer, a lion, and a seal. All right. So 
along the top part is where we have our characteristics or our traits. So we have to come up with traits and characteristics that will not only help us to establish the phylogeny, but also help to establish outgroups and how the phylogeny breaks up. So the one thing that we came up with that they all have is that they're all vertebrates. They'll have a spinal column, they'll have a backbone. So we'll use this in a digital sense, meaning uh, with computers read things digitally with either ones or twos, ones being on, zeros being off, zeros and ones I mean. Um, zeros are off, these all have it, so we're gonna put down ones all the way down. So there's ones all the way down. So from that point, we wanna start breaking this apart, and again, these guys are set up pretty easily, so you can tell we're gonna try and take out this guy first, this guy next, and so forth. So the next thing that we're going to have, and sometimes it's pretty easy to see, like this guy has no legs, these guys all do. So we're going to use this term tetrapod. So because this doesn't have it, we're going to use a zero. And the rest of the guys do have it, so they're going to put ones all the way down. I'm going to put a star next to this one, because this is now our next, or our first, what they call outgroup. And I'm going to draw an arrow down from here, over to here. This is our first out group, and it's pretty easy to understand. It's for the first group that is out of the phylogeny. And we'll keep putting asterisks by those to indicate which one's out first. The next trait that we used was mammary glands. Mammary glands are the glands that uh, mammals have um, that lactate and produce milk for the young. So all mammals have mammary glands. So the important thing is when you keep going through this, you don't want to do any trait that's going to bring the old outgroup back into the phylogeny. So the eels don't have it, the iguanas don't have it, so they are a new outgroup. However, the deer, the lion, and the seal all have that, the, that, the trait. So continuing on with this, the next thing that we came up with was a true carnivore. The one thing that we had figured out or thought about was using carnivore as one, but a freshwater eel does eat meat, however it's a scavenger. So a true carnivore is something that eats only uh, living stuff, like a, um, a seal and a, and a snake. They only eat things that are alive. So the freshwater eel is still out, the iguana is out, the deer is now our new outgroup, and the lion and the seal continue on. The last thing that we came up with to separate the lion and the seal was something called the aquatic lung. And the, that's something that makes it so um, animals can stay underwater for a long period of time and they kind of recycle the gases that are in their lungs. So dolphins and whales and seals can do this. So eels have gills, so they don't fall into that. So eels are zero, iguana, deer, lions are new outgroup and the seal does have the aquatic lung. So on this end of the chart, you can see that the freshwater eel has one shared derived characteristic. Iguanas have two, three, four, five as we go down. So this is set up really nice and easy, and scientists would never have the fortunate uh, luck to be able to run into this. But, it's, but when you compare who's more closely related to two, to who, you can look at the freshwater eel and the iguana, and you say, how many traits do they have in common? Well, they only have the one in common. So you can do the same thing with the seal. In this group, the freshwater eel only has one trait in common with any of these. But you can compare these. Which ones are more closely related? The iguana and the deer, or the lion and the seal? Well, the iguana and the deer only have two in common. The lion and the seal have four. So based on that, they have more closely related ties evolutionarily than um, the other organisms that are in that group. Now. Uh, there's a bottom part on here. We'll come back to that in a minute, but let's go ahead and go to the back side and I'll tell you how the actual cladograms work themselves. So the cladogram is basically a visual, the visual family tree. Oops, whoopsie. The visual family tree. The point of the cladogram uh, is to establish evolutionary relatedness again. So let me get rid of this, put this off to the side a little bit more. The point of it is to establish 
evolutionary relatedness um, based on shared derived and it has to be derived if you don't have a trait if it's not derived meaning it's not homologous it doesn't have the same common ancestry you can't use those characteristics for the phylogeny or that cladogram because it's not related on shared derived characteristics or traits now the last three questions I kind of summarized really quickly with the, with, the, with the kiddos. It says, when making cladograms, why is it important to know whether a structure is analogous or homologous? Well, it's like we just said. If it's analogous, there's a feature like the shark's fin and a dolphin's fin. Those are based on convergent evolution. They have no common ancestry, so you cannot use that to make a, a, a cladogram or establish any sort of phylogeny. Um, so, with regard to analogous things, they're the result of convergent evolution, which answers question four, but that's because there's no common ancestry. I think it's an ancestry. No common ancestry. Therefore, when they ask about relatedness, do these analogies, analogies relate to analogous structures. Do these analogies show relatedness? And that's a big no. All right. Analogy. Um, analogous structures are also referred to as analogies. So it's kind of just a different way of saying an analogous structure. All right. So you'll see the cladogram here. There's a dark line at the top that you don't normally see on cladograms. The dark line at the top represents. Mrs. Lund, please dial 4401. Jessica Lund, dial 4401, please. The dark line represents present day. So number seven says, like, what does the dark line at the top represent? It represents present day. So if you were to see an organism that doesn't, or one of these lines that stops short of here, you know that that means that that organism went extinct. Uh, the first thing that you want to do whenever you see a cladogram is let's put in these trait gates, these nodes that um, represent the traits that separate out the phylogeny and establish your, your outgroups. So whenever you have a branch that separates, the point at which they separate the, the fork in the middle, if you will, right here, that's going to be called the node. So nodes are where the outgroups separate from the phylogeny, but I also call them trait gates um, because they represent traits. And in order to pass through that phylogeny, continue on that phylogeny, you have to get have that trait and get through that gate, if you will. Okay, So you're going to put a trait there, a gate here. Uh, a, no a node here, they're all nodes or gates or traits, whatever you want to call them. So we have a node here, 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 and they all represent trait gates. So we're going to call this one number one, two, three, four, five. And number question number eight says, which ones are most closely related, D and E or C and E? So whenever you think about these trait gates or these nodes, think about it like this. When this when these group of ancestors were traveling through time uh, evolutionarily, and then it wasn't literally like they were walking on this line, but this is the representation visually of what it was. They were moving through time. They all had this trait, so they continued on through the time. There were organisms that, in that population, did not have the same adaptation, either by mutation or just normal variation, such that they couldn't make it through this. And that's where the speciation event happened because they went and processed themselves into a different niche and they went this way in this niche. And over time and over time, more mutations collectively built up in each direction that they were separated by quite enough. So I kind of think of it like it was a red rover, red rover, let Kyle come over. So in order to get through this gate and keep going down this phylogeny and to pass through these nodes, you have to have that trait. If you don't have that trait, you can't get through the gate and then you're backed up and you go down that phylogeny okay, or down that outgroup. So, the best way to do this is to try and figure out how many characteristics uh, different organisms have in common. For instance, like D and E, I'm going to put like little brackets here. There's one there and one there. And then I'm going to put the number that, that they have um, in common right below. But like for D and E, I'm going to go to the last place that D and E evolutionarily met in time. And it was right at this point. Then I'm going to count back through evolutionary time 
the number of common traits that they have, the number of shared derived characteristics they have in, tr in common. They have one, two, three, four. So D and E, right here, is four. And again, these traits could represent anything just like A, B, and C don't represent anything other than just some random organism that we're going to use for the example of figuring out how to do these cladograms. C and E, the last place that they met, was right here. So again, you count back the other way, the same way, and you go down and you see how many traits they have in common. C and E only have three traits in common. So when you look at this and you say, who is more closely related to who, D and E is more closely related to each other than C and E are to each other. So we'll go to the back to the front to kind of figure out how we're going to use the example of the deer, the lion, the iguana, and the freshwater eel and so forth to make a cladogram and how a scientist would do this. So on the very bottom, you basically draw a diagonal line and you start building your cladogram. We're not going to put in the present day line at the top, but we're going to have to start out what was the one trait that unifies this phylogeny and that was that they were all vertebrates. So I'm going to write down vertebrates in my node, down on the bottom, and then you know, like we talked about before, that they all had this trait, so they were all able to pass to that node. So evolutionarily, they're all moving in time. And then when you get to the next node, the next trait gate was tetrapod. So the one organism that did not have that trait was the eel. So it could not pass this gate, essentially. So visually speaking, it went off in this direction in its own outgroup. So I'm going to put the eel at the top of this, and we continue to build the, the cladogram that way. The next node that we had was the mammary glands. And the iguana was the one that did not have it and could not pass through here. So it went up in this direction. And we now have a new outgroup for them. The next one was the true carnivore. And the deer could not pass that gate, so it went out on its own outgroup. The last one was the aquatic lung. And the lion was the one who did not have that, so they went off on their own lion um, outgroup. And so these are a species that evolved way back in time, and these populations are the ones that went out in these outgroups. I don't want you to think it was just individual lion, guana, and deer walking together. But in theory, all scientists think that we all had, if you go back far enough in time, we all evolutionarily had connections at some point. So we want to see how those connections started to, uh, came together and then separated at some point. So when you count these up, and you look at deer, I'm sorry, the, uh, the deer is going to be here all the way at the end. Not a seal. Seal, seal. Thank you. Good thing I have collar there. A seal and a lion. The last place the seal and the lion met was right here. You count back, there's four traits that they have in common. So who's most uh, who has the most common traits in this phylogeny? It's gonna be the seal. Who has the least? The eel. Um, because they have the least derived traits. Are they all still present? Yeah, they're all still present. They all met at this line. And they're all still here together. But you can see who has more and who has less. And you can do that whole thing with who's more complex and who has more traits. Now, we're going to go to the back page of this. And we have this cladogram in the back. And the same thing that I always harp on. I said, what is the first thing you do? 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 When you see a cladogram, make sure that you put your nodes in, your trait gates in. So typically what I, have, I see them do is this. They have no problem. They always want to put a line right here. That's not it. In order to have an outgroup, you have to have a trait gate or a node before that. So we'll put one here. There's one here. There's one here. There's one here. And there's one here. Now, that isn't all of them. Net, there's, there's, there's one other issue that we have with this the, the up here. And I'm going to give you options A, B, and C. A, B, and C. And so when I ask students, I go, which one do you think is the correct one? Well, most of them are okay with A. They know that you have to have the trait gate somewhere after the outgroups. But some people think it's either B or C. Well, in order to have trait gate or the outgroup occur for species D, you had to have trait gate C in there. So C is the correct one. Okay, so I'm going to scribble these two out. 
and then I'm going to number the rest of them. This is going to be one, two, three, four, five, all right, six, but the one that most people miss, and this is probably the biggest mistake, if somebody gets something wrong with Playroom, this is why they make, this is why they get it wrong. They always forget this one, the seventh one. The one trait gate, or the one node that unifies the entire phylogeny together. So the questions below talk about, all right, so A and B, B and C, who has more, who has, you know, who's more closely related and so forth. And we're going to start off with just A really quick. Uh, by the way, we have organism B. This is why I wanted to put that present day line thing in, because you will see this in true uh, cladograms every once in a while, where B is just there, and you're like, what happened? There must have been some sort of error with uh, Jacob's you know, Word document. No, B is extinct. It did not make it to present day. Okay? So A and B, though, if you go back to the last place that A and B met, they met right here, and you work your way back in time, they only had one trait in common. B and C, the last place they met, if you take B and you follow it all the way down here, all the way down here, where B was, and then you work your way back, they had two traits in common. So B and C are more closely related in that group because they have true two traits in common. Now I'm going to go down through the rest of them. Number two, B and C has two traits in common. And you can work along with your worksheet because you got it there in front of you. Um, C and D, the last place they met is right here. And remember, we scribble out this junk and this junk. The only person that actually has trait number six is C. So when you count back the number of common traits, you go right here, and you go all the way back and all the way back. They only have, C and D only have three traits in common. They have number one, two, and seven in common. So C and D are going to be close, more closely related than B and C. Number three asks D and C, which has three, and then G and F. G and F, the last place that G and F met was right here. Wait, I have a question. Hang on. G and F, if you count your way back, you go one, two, three, four, five. G and F actually have five in common. And here's what ends up happening. People want to include this because it's behind G and F in this direction. Number six, but the only person that has six is C. So that doesn't happen. G and F, what they have in actual common are four, three, two, one, and seven. So they have five in common, so G and F are more closely related. Kyle, go ahead. Um, so when C and D and all the other ones went off, duh. Did C and D just not make it past the third gate, so they went off on their own? Correct. C and, there was no D, actually, at first. And this gets into kind of some weird theoretical stuff. There was only C, and then another mutation happened in the C population that caused the spacing to happen. So I'm actually going to take a break from that, go back to the front real quick. This is the one thing that can happen. And this is kind of the beauty with the cladogram. If you look at the cladogram, we were going to, I was going to do this uh, later than sooner. But let's say I'm a scientist and I, ex I find a fossil of an animal that I call a crocodile. okay? Just go with the name. It's basically a crocodile, alligator, whatever one you want to basically call it. But what they'll do is with this cladogram, they'll look at it and go, all right, this is the beauty of the cladogram. So once you have it set up, you can plug in any animal and you can see where evolutionarily they relate, as long as you have all the evidence. And that's the only problem. A lot of times we find some more evidence that we can add to it and it switches up just a little bit. However, it adds to our understanding of science. So crocogator, if you look at this, you go, does it, is it a vertebrate? Yeah, it's going to be a vertebrate, so it's going to go through it. Is it a tetrapod that has four limbs? Yes. Is it a mammal? Does it have mammary glands? Crocodile or an alligator or crocogator, whatever you want to call it, does not have that. So it does not make it to this trait gate. So it is part of the iguana outgroup. Okay? So there were just iguanas, or I should actually say there were probably just crocogators at one point. But then there was this weird thing. Crocogator eats mainly meat. And again, this is hypothetical when we're making this up. Iguanas eat only er, uh, plants. So within the crocogator uh, population, there was a mutation of only being an herbivore, only eating plants. So when they went through that, the iguana made it through. The iguana variation, the iguana mutation made it through. Who didn't make it through? The crocogator. So the crocogator came over in this direction, all right? So that's how they address it. And that's how when you see something like this with the C and D, that's what happened. There was no D or C. There was just one common group, and then they split up, okay? 
So E and G is on four. E and G, the last place they met was right here. And again, you count your way back, not including six. They have seven, one, two, and three traits, or traits number seven, one, two, and three in common. So they have four traits in common. C and D, right here, still only have the three traits in common. So E and G are more closely related. Um, the two last ones are probably the most tricky one, F and G, because everybody always wants to include six in there. F and G only have one, two, three, four, five traits in common. D and E, because they're so closely related, linked together on this picture, but it's just a picture, people go, oh, and they want to link them together. But if you go way back to where they actually met, all the way this way, this way, this way, this way, the last spot that D and E actually met was right here. So they actually have the same amount of traits in common as C and D have with each other. So D and E have traits number seven, one, and two in common, just like C and D do. Cop? I thought you said D didn't come along until C branched off. C and D branched off from the same family, the okay. same out group. The same out group. Okay, so that is basically the breakdown of cladistics and cladograms. You're essentially going to see um, the hardest one you'll probably see on, on most tests is something like you'll have four branches going like this, pretty basic, pretty easy, and they'll label it A, B, C, and D. And you just got to remember the first thing that you want to do is make sure that you put in your trait gates, count them off, and they'll say who's more closely related to who. Well, if you say D and C are most closely related to each other in this group, you just got to be able to do this. How many traits do they have in common? Find the last spot that they met, work your way back. One, two, they have three traits in common, right? Um, one other one that we worked through, uh, and I sent this home with one class today. I said, uh, what superheroes are more closely related to each other? And we put down Robin. And this is kind of a goofy, funny one. We put down Robin. We put down Batman. We put down uh, Spider-Man. And Superman. And I think the one unifying thing that we said they all had is that they were all, they all had dark hair. And you could use a number of different things, but this is like basically so you understand how it works. Um, what separated out the rest of them was that uh, we said these guys all had a full leotard. And you'll have to correct me if I'm not completely up on my superhero uh, information, but that's where we're at. We also said uh, one other thing it could be for this one is they, the rest of these guys had no parents. So that was part of one of the unifying traits that they had. Um, the other one that we said for these guys is they had full, for the last two unifying ones, they had full superpowers, like supernatural superpowers. And then of course, if you look at Superman, Super one, Superman's uh, the only one that can fly. So you can see there's a number of different ways you can do it. Uh, we even did one more where we looked at um, this scenario. We put a fish here. We put um, a chicken. We put a fish, a chicken, uh, a cow, and then we put down. Um, a, I think we're gonna do. A, let's do a cheetah. Some bizarre animal, right? And we said. Who should, or based on the cladogram, what should a cheetah taste most like? Which is just bizarre, but again, first thing you want to do when you see a cladogram, put your trait gates in. All right, since we're talking about a cheetah, who's the cheetah most closely related to? So what's going to be the cow? And it's got the last place they met evolutionary is here, so they've got three traits in common. And because a cheetah is most closely related to a cow, you could say that she would probably taste most like a cow. I mean, it's a silly argument, but from a cladogram, a cladistics perspective, that's probably um, a good argument for that. So, I don't think I have any other things to say. Kyle, questions? Uh, no, not really. All right.
Uh, good luck and stay classy.